And here to talk about the therapeutic benefits of gardening is Esther McGinnis. Esther McGinnis is an extension horticulturist in the Department of Plant Sciences here at NDSU. Esther, welcome to the forums. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> So gardeners intuitively know that gardening is good for their health, you know, both from a mental health perspective and also from a physical perspective. Oops, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo here. Yeah, it's my fault, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so gardeners intuitively know that gardening is good for their health, uh, both mentally and physically. Come back, back. There we go. <laughs> now, I learned this when I was much younger. So when my parents... Um, my, when my parents were raising me, they were really big into gardening. My mother had an absolutely fantastic flower garden. And my own father um, would come home from work. He would be stressed out. He would go into the garden. And what he would do is he would pull weeds for 15 minutes. We knew not to bother him. He could certainly have used herbicide, but that, that wasn't his style. He needed those 15 minutes of weed pulling as essentially horticulture therapy. And then after that, he could kind of let go of the stress of his job and move on. Well, I've kind of held on to that. Um, oops, that one. <laughs> Sorry, I'm moving my hands. <laughs> well, um, so we're seeing society brace the therapeutic aspects of gardens. And here we have a photo of Georgia Tech University right on the outskirts of downtown Atlanta, right in the middle of a big metropolitan area. And, and this is where kids go to school. Uh, now, you can imagine that you've got a junior that has a, a math test at 2 o'clock, and, and the student is stressed. You know, he's thinking about all those math equations that he has to recall. But then he goes to the student union up to this rooftop garden. And as he's wandering through this area, um, the student's blood pressure probably drops a little bit. Um, you know, he starts to think clearer, and, and all in all, is probably in better shape to take that test. So we're seeing this, this sort of response in more and more settings, and we're starting to have the science to back this up. <clears throat> so we're seeing that in, in healthcare settings, that patients in hospitals, in fact, will recover faster in the presence of plants. So Dr. Park did a, uh, did a couple of studies in 2008 and 2009, and in both studies, she uh, placed many different um, house plants in the patient's room. So there'd be about 10 to 12 foliage plants, um, some flowering plants, and then in the control group, there were no plants. Now, she, she studied some very routine surgeries, you know, appendectomies and uh, thyroid surgeries, and then made comparisons. <clears throat> The surgical patients recovered much faster if they had a room that was filled with plants. The control group did not go home as fast. Now with the, the patients with plants, um, they reported less pain, and this was manifested by the fact that they took fewer pain relievers. Um, there were other objective measures. They, re they had lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, and then they reported less fatigue and less anxiety. So we're seeing there are health benefits to plants. You know, here these are indoor plants, and the patients were recovering a little bit faster. So we've got scientific evidence for, for horticulture therapy. <clears throat> Next slide. We're seeing that uh, horticulture therapy has quite a bit of impact for senior citizens. So in a Dutch study from 2012, um, they, they looked at a group of 62-year-olds. <coughs> Excuse me. The 62-year-olds, um, for the most part, were divided into uh, groups that either gardened or didn't. The, the 62-year-olds that gardened um, had much higher uh, health indices in every category. So we can see this can improve not just your mental health, but also your physical health. Now, with senior citizens, gardeners are reported to have more hand strength, and this is important. We're seeing a lot of gardeners um, that, that are actually coping a little bit better with arthritis and some of these other afflictions, but they are maintaining that hand strength through digging and, and pruning in the garden. 
Now, when, when it comes to older senior citizens, those that are working in nursing homes, they found that the nursing home residents that worked in the garden were much more engaged in the social life of the nursing home and, and in life in, in particular. When it comes to Alzheimer's patients and patients with dementia, we see that if they, if they are working a little bit with horticulture, that they have increased functioning and, and increased cognitive skills. So some fantastic science to support gardening in general. Okay. So today we're gonna to talk about a couple outshoots of, of horticulture therapy. We're gonna talk about healing gardens and we're going to talk about enabling gardens. Now obviously there are a lot of different fields within horticulture therapy uh, but Tom's only given me 25 minutes. <laughs> 30, okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll start off with healing gardens. Now technically any garden can have healing properties but we're going to focus on gardens that are affiliated with healthcare institutions and nursing homes and in this photo, we see one that is connected to a cemetery. Um, so I absolutely just love this photo. Uh, so you can imagine that you've got some grieving relatives visiting uh, a grave site, and then they see this healing garden next door, and they feel welcome. They see that arbor, they enter through the arbor, and they see all the, this profusion of plants, very life-affirming. But we can have similar results with hospitals. <clears throat> So here's a, a healing garden that is in the courtyard of a hospital. And this is a place of refuge and healing, but not just for the patients. You know, obviously the patients can look out their windows or even go down to it, but it's also a place of refuge for their family members and visitors that are suffering stress from having a loved one in the hospital. And it's also a place of refuge for hospital workers. Can you imagine the stress they're under? You know, they see life and death situations every day. So the healing gardens are every bit as much for hospital workers. So these gardens are designed to provide a feeling of safety. They help reduce stress and then increase overall well-being. In order for the healing garden to be effective, <clears throat> It needs to be aesthetically appealing or else it's just not going to work. There's, so there's very much a visual component. And then the, the visitors need to have some choices. You know, do they want to be, sit in the sun or do they want to go in the shade? Do they want to be in the open or do they want a little bit of privacy to talk with a loved one? But overall, a healing garden must be quiet because the whole point here is to have that sense of peace. You don't want this placed next to a noisy air conditioner system. You don't want this along a street. So when you're situating your healing garden, whether it's in an institutional setting or even behind your house, make sure that it's in a quiet location. <clears throat> a healing garden should have a nice pathway. Now you can certainly customize this for the population that you're serving. Now if you have uh, people that are quite mobile, then you can certainly use maybe some gravel or some mulch. Um, however, if you have people that are in wheelchairs or in walkers or using a cane, then it becomes very important to have a pathway that is paved and smooth. The width is very important. Um, if you have one-way traffic around a loop, then you want a minimum of five feet for the pathway. If you have um, wheelchairs that are going to be going in opposite directions, then definitely seven to eight feet. For individuals that may be visually impaired, you want to make sure that the edge of the pathway is a little different. So that can be denoted by a change in color, change in texture, just so they can see and, and don't fall off the path. Now make sure you don't have a curb or a raised area because that in fact can be a tripping hazard. <clears throat> Seating is incredibly important in these gardens. We want people to linger. Uh, we want them to take a seat and enjoy the sun on their face, maybe meditate, pray, or just have a quiet discussion with a loved one. You know, on the left, we have a nice wooden bench. On the right, we have you know this gorgeous cast iron uh, bench. So there's a lot of different seating options that you can use. Now I have to admit, um, 
the setting on the left is a little less calming, at least for myself. There's an espalier on the back wall. An espalier is when you train a tree to be two-dimensional. So it's flat up against that fence. <clears throat> so that happens to be an apple tree. Now, if I was sitting there, I'd be contemplating, oh, you should be pruning that. It's not looking as, as well as it should. So it is very important to have a well-manicured healing garden. <clears throat> and then incorporate a water element. So the sound, it's the sound of water that is so calming. So if you can have a fountain, if you can have just some trickling water, it's really the sound people are after. And it's just a, a child magnet, but it also draws adults and senior citizens. If you're doing a healing garden in a smaller setting and don't have the funds for a big fountain, you know, there, there are definitely um, cheaper Fountains that are on the market that can be for a hundred, or even those tabletop uh, fountains, probably for twenty-five, fifty dollars. So this can be done at any scale. <clears throat> when you're designing the garden, make sure that it's it's simple and symmetrical. Uh, simpli simplicity is kind of a no-brainer. If the garden is really cluttered, that's not going to be a calming environment. You'll also want the garden to be relatively symmetrical because that's going to give you a balanced feel. Um, now, this isn't my favorite garden out of all the slides, but it does show you a symmetrical garden and a nice focal point. So you have a, a pedestal and an urn in the distance. Vegetation is going to be some of the most important elements in your garden. So the more green you can add, the better, because green is so calming. Now, aren't you feeling a little bit more calm as you take a look at this photo? I mean, the colors are just so rich. And can you imagine yourself walking through a forest and your heart is just, the heartbeat is, is slowing down? And that's exactly what we want. So incorporate some smaller scale trees and shrubs, um, and then have some contrast. Because at the same time, if you have if you have a couple of shrubs or flowers that have contrasting colors, that will invigorate you and maybe refresh you. Here we have a Japanese maple in the foreground with the red-leaved foliage. Unfortunately, not hardy to North Dakota, but it does show you an example of, of some nice, uh, nice contrast. <clears throat> and then engage the senses. These should be sensory gardens. So engage all five of the senses. Uh, you want to have you know, beautiful colors like the pink is still be on the left. And then you have contrasting textures. You've got the finer. Uh, texture of the astilbe leaf contrasted with the hosta. Now you can incorporate um, some plants that have unique uh, have have a unique texture that you can feel with your hands, uh, like lamb's ear. Uh, in the middle picture, we have an ornamental grass. Now ornamental grasses engage probably all of the senses, but they have something unique. As they sway in the breezes, they produce this really wonderful um, rustling sound. And that's called susurration. So there's even that, there's a term for that. The picture on the right, um, we've got sweet alyssum lining the pathway, and I can almost I can almost smell that the fragrance from sweet alyssum is just so sweet, honey-like. Uh, so just some wonderful things to stimulate the senses. <clears throat> Include some edible herbs because then you can have people taste the herbs, or at least they can bruise the foliage, release the oils, and, and, and the scent is just so wonderful. So herbs work really nicely, particularly if you've got a healing garden next to a children's hospital, then you don't have to worry about toxic plants. Um, this could be next to a psychiatric ward, it could be um, <clears throat> next to a nursing home where you have Alzheimer's patients. So herbs are a fantastic addition. And then avoid toxic plants you know, in those same situations. So I have a photo of a Datura there. Daturas are absolutely gorgeous, but very, uh, but very toxic. And even the foliage, you don't, there's some people that are very allergic to it. So avoid those types of plants, avoid castor beans. And you can find a list of toxic plants through the Iowa Poison Control Center. They have a nice list there. Cacti, should we include cacti? Well, they're not very calming. <laughs> you know, they're just kind of pokey plants. And let's face it, 
nobody can can resist touching a cactus i mean at least just a little bit there's my daughter every cactus plant she goes by she has to poke it uh, so we don't we don't want our visitors to the healing garden getting thorns in their in their fingers now, if you're building a, a healing garden in Arizona, I don't know what you do. I, I, I've got nothing there for you. But in North Dakota, no cacti, please. <clears throat> artwork. You can certainly include artwork, but be very careful about the artwork that you select. So there's an architect that specializes in healing gardens, and he has a special phrase, the artwork should be unambiguously positive. Uh, so I've got some examples of, of what not to use. So we have a few photos taken from the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. So you've got a giant praying mantis over my daughter's shoulder. There's, that's a little, that's, it's a little threatening. And then you've got a, a spider in the, the right hand that's, again, lurking over her shoulder. Probably not best to include in a hospital setting. What about abstract art? Well, abstract art can, can be well done in a garden. <clears throat> However, not for a healing garden. And that's because people that are coping with illnesses, they may be depressed um, and feeling pain, they may project negative thoughts or feelings into abstract artwork. So therefore, it's better to use something that's more representational, something that's non-controversial, something that's calming like the... Um, like the wisteria vine on the left or the beautiful blown poppies on the right. <clears throat> Include wildlife in your design. So it's, it's just great fun for people of all ages to watch birds. You can include uh, these wonderful bird houses like the purple martin house on the left um, and then feed the birds so they're drawn. And remember to plant for hummingbirds. Everybody loves to watch hummingbirds as they come feed on nectar. <clears throat> but above all, the garden must be well maintained. I don't know if you can see the photo on the left. That's a hosta that's been beaten up by some slugs. I'm not feeling calming thoughts when I look at that. I don't. I know Tom isn't either. <laughs> and for those of you that are that are looking at that, you're probably wondering what caused that. How can you control that? So you're focusing on how you can fix that rather than focusing on on calming thoughts and how to improve your health. Same with the powdery mildew on the leaves. So we want to make sure the garden's well maintained and it also reflects, reflects on the professionalism of the hospital or the nursing home. You know, if your garden isn't well maintained, you start to wonder, are they taking care of their patients well? Are they so it's just something to consider. So we're now going to move on to the second kind of garden. The first kind of garden, a healing garden, is kind of passive. You just walk through and enjoy the benefits. You're not necessarily active in it. Now with enabling gardens, we want people of all ages and all abilities to partake in the garden, to get their hands dirty, to water and to weed and to plant so that they can enjoy all the therapeutic benefits of the garden. <clears throat> And this is particularly true as we age. I know I'm starting to feel my age a little bit more. I don't enjoy bending over to garden as much anymore. And I think that's true of large sections of our audience. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about all sorts of gardens that will enable you to, to garden you know, into your 70s and 80s and beyond. So this is a garden that Barb actually mentioned in the previous talk. This is, uh, this is a handicap accessible garden right on the campus of NDSU, and it was built specifically for individuals in wheelchairs. So you've got that nice U-shaped alcove, so you can wheel right into that bay and start gardening. And then you can also lean over to either side and reach plants and pull weeds. We're going to be seeing more and more of these gardens. I'm seeing more of these types of gardens uh, affiliated with nursing homes. <clears throat> well, not all of us are in, in wheelchairs yet, so we start thinking about raised gardens. Now, these are some, some of the more easily built raised gardens, so this will get you maybe 10 inches off the ground. I think these are 2 by 10s. I'm not good with my lumber dimensions. But, you know, it gets you, it gets you off the ground, but you can think higher yet. So these are some of the raised beds that we take care of at the Red River Valley Zoo. But there's no reason that you can't build these gardens um, for yourself in your backyard. So as, as you're getting older, you know, maybe 
maybe contract to have raised beds built where you don't have to bend over at all. Of course, you need to consider, you know, will this be a standing garden or a sitting garden? You can customize it to however you like. You can add a bench or you can bring in a chair or a bucket, but really easy to garden in this situation. Now, you, you do need to consider dimensions. Now, in the previous photo, um, it was accessible from all sides, so the dimensions could be a maximum of four feet across. Here we've got a trellis on the back side, so we want that to be a narrower dimension. <clears throat> now, if you don't want to build something, there are kits that you can assemble very easily. So these are uh, the one on the left I saw at an expo, and it comes with that beautiful little bench. So a wonderful place. You could even even uh, stick a small cherry tomato there, you know, plant, plant some lettuces. Uh, on the right, we've got an herb garden. So wonderful for small plants, uh, but they're all different dimensions. You know, you can certainly purchase different dimensions, one that will be a little higher up, so an individual in a wheelchair can just uh, extend their legs beneath that. If you don't like to, to bend over, go vertical. I mean, look at that tower on the left-hand side. Uh, now, the planting depth isn't going to be too deep, so you would need to use, you know, like a radish or, or a lettuce, something that's not deep-rooted. But that's kind of a fun one because you can put drip tape at each level and it becomes truly low maintenance. Um, or plant something that's vining. Um, so we've got tomatoes. These are our tomatoes out at Absaraca that have been trained to grow up that string. You, know, you could use a trellis, but you could do the same with cucumbers, you know, and melons. Get them off the ground, and that's actually healthier for the plants because you've got more ventilation and they're less prone to disease. <clears throat> or consider a gutter garden. So these are kind of new to me, but people are buying gutters. Um, now, you can see they're at an angle, so they will drain, but you can plant lettuces. Um, there are individuals growing strawberries in gutter gardens, but you're, you're getting them up off the ground so you can reach them. Um, one of the concerns, though, with this is that if you've got them on a fence or located on the back of your garage, do consider planting more shade-tolerant types of plants. Lettuces are, are definitely better for that than some of the, the flowering types of vegetables. <clears throat> salad tables. Now these are becoming really popular at nursing homes. So a salad table is actually hydroponics. So you could do this either indoors or outdoors, but with hydroponics there's no soil involved. Instead you have a water solution that has all the nutrients, macro and micronutrients included. Uh, now in this situation, or if you look at the left table, we have three Rubbermaid containers. They're like 10-gallon Rubbermaid containers that are nestled into that, um, that table. They're filled up to the top with the solution. The plants are, are sitting in a little basket filled with perlite. Um, the perlite wicks um, the water up, up to the plant. Uh, now, the top part of the roots are drier, so that facilitates air exchange, and then the bottom parts of the roots are submerged in the solution. This type of salad table does not require an electrical outlet um, because there's no bubbler associated with this. But it's very important that a part of the root system is above the water line to facilitate that gas exchange. Now, here are a couple plans. You could certainly customize this to any container you have, but if you really want um, the plans to this, my former boss designed this at the University of Minnesota, Tom Michaels. He was our department head. And if you Google University of Minnesota salad table, you can pull up a manual that he produced for building these. But I think these are great, uh, great for nursing homes. And then if you have supp a supplemental light source, you can then do this indoors. <clears throat> Now I have a, a wheel, a wheelbarrow in this photo. So this is a wheelbarrow that can come and go. So if you have somebody that really can't go much further than the back of the house, you can have a relative wheel, the wheelbarrow directly to you, uh, and then you can work with it, and then it, it can be then transported back to a direct sun exposure um, when you're done with it. So just get creative. So we just want people to continue gardening, you know, at all ages and at all abilities. 
And then last of all, consider containers. Containers are so portable. If you have, particularly if you have a smaller container, you can put it on a table outdoors, work with it, do some deadheading and pruning, fertilize it. Um, so containers are, are the ultimate when it comes to, uh, to senior citizens and really to everybody. Everybody loves to garden in a container. Um, so, so keep in mind, there's also lots of different vegetable series that are now more compact and that can be grown in containers. So you can search those out. <clears throat> so what do you do with a hanging basket? I have to tell you, these are hanging baskets at my own house and I can't reach them. So if you know me, I'm about five feet tall or maybe a little less, which I'll never admit to. <laughs> Yes, and whenever anybody meets me, they're like, darn, you're short. So I can't reach my hanging basket, so I have to ask my husband, who's almost six feet tall, to water for me. And it's kind of a blow to my pride. So I'm now thinking, what can I do in this situation? Because I can't deadhead, and I'm, I have to rely on my, my poor husband to do this. So I'm thinking, this, this spring, I'm going to invest in pulleys so that I can use a pulley system to lower the plants down to my height so I can check on them, I can fertilize them, and deadhead them. So, you know, there are all these, all these really unique solutions, you know, for everybody, you know, no matter your physical limitations. <clears throat> and then consider tools, you know, to take some of the labor out of it. Now, if you still have a traditional garden, a vegetable garden that's in the ground, you don't have to bend over to plant. You can buy these sowers. Now, I haven't personally used a tool like this, but I'm, I'd be willing to experiment with it. Uh, and then on the right, we have an auger that connects to a power drill. So wonderful. If you don't have hand strength, you can, uh, you can use, instead of using a trowel, you can use this to dig a hole, and plant your bulbs, plant some of your smaller annuals. Um, so use power tools. They're, they're really freeing. <clears throat> now, if you have carpal tunnel or have problems, you know, gripping things, there are ergonomic tools designed just for you. Uh, so here we have one where you can kind of grip um, the handle in a more natural type of, of hold, and you'll then get more leverage. But also consider longer handle tools. So use the power of leverage instead of exhausting all your strength. On the right, we have this wonderful stool. I just love this. I'm, I'm thinking about investing in this one. So instead of kneeling and weeding, you can sit and, and weed. And that stool will, in fact, rotate so you can go from side to side. You know, if you've got a sidewalk next to your garden, you just kind of roll along the garden. Now, these are all from disability work tools. I'm not endorsing that particular company. I've never worked with them. But these are just examples of some of the tools that are on the market. And make sure you have a handy cart. So instead of lifting all those heavy containers, you know, buy yourself a nice cart, and then you can just use that to transport your plants and your tools and your grandchildren across your property. <clears throat> All right, so I'm hoping that you've learned a little something, that your intuition is right. There are wonderful health benefits to gardening, both mental and physical. So continue gardening, and the longer you can garden um, as, as senior citizens, the better. But instead of hurting your back, you know, start thinking about ways that you can continue gardening, uh, so thinking smarter. But also think spring, so I'm hoping that if all of you collectively in the audience, if you can think warm spring <laughs> thoughts, you will bring spring to North Dakota instead of this snow that we got today. <laughs> all right, thank you, and I'll, I'll take questions. 50 tomorrow, I heard, so it's coming. I hope the snow's gone, at least on Monday nights. <clears throat> okay, here's a question about the healing garden you talk about in hospitals. Who do you think uh, takes care of those? Do you think it's on-site personnel, or do you think they have a contract, a garden center, or a company to take care of it? I think it's dependent upon the hospital and the sources of funds. So larger hospitals do have the funds to contract with a service to come and take care of the gardens. Um, however, with smaller gardens and far, I would say gardens here in Fargo and Moorhead, we do have some master gardeners that are taking care of some of these healing gardens. Um, for example, the VA hospital here in Fargo. 
So it's probably it's probably a combination. Okay, good. How about uh, if someone was interested in putting in an enabling garden, is there a good resource that you would recommend? Like, how do we get started? How do we figure out, like, what would be a good design for a garden? Is there an organization that has a resource or a good book that you recommend? You know, probably the best resource that I've seen on enabling gardens is through University of Wyoming Extension. So you, know, you can certainly Google Wyoming Extension and enabling gardens or accessible gardens. They have oh, probably a 20 page manual mm -hmm. on how to go about doing this. It's just a wonderful, wonderful manual. And there are definitely more and more books on the market about this and people are interested. Well, okay, here's a question with that hydroponic bed. Um, do you think the vegetables taste different when they're grown hydroponically versus a raised bed? That's a great question. I think they do taste differently. Um, I remember when I remember when I was um, in school, we actually tried using different fertilizers and such, and it really can have a major impact on the flavor. And I don't think we know enough to necessarily maximize flavor when it comes to hydroponic solutions. You know, as home gardeners. But there are definitely commercial producers out there that grow their tomatoes completely hydroponically. We, uh, I visited one producer and he was selling to James Beard award winning chefs. So there are some people that have figured out kind of the right combination of nutrients. But it is, it is definitely as much an art as a science. But personally, I, I, think my, I think my veggies would taste better coming out of, out of soil. I do notice a difference. So if you have a problem watering a hanging basket, why don't you just hang it lower? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, Tom is picking up y'all. <laughs> Let's wait for a question here. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have a recommendation for the types of flowers that would grow well in a soil environment, uh, mulch with wood chips, and has a cooler soil? Has a cooler soil. You know, I would I would recommend um, growing lower maintenance uh, foliage type plants. Um, now I use hostas like ground covers, so I'll I'll just blanket you know big sections with different varieties of hostas. I like other foliage plants like heucras. Now those those tend to be more shade tolerant plants, but if you're talking about cooler soils, they work very nicely. Um, now in sun in sunny locations um, where it's going to be a little hotter and drier, you know choose you know something like um, uh, like bee balm. Choose um, Nepeta or cat mint, you know, some of these are really tough, you know, and what I would do is plant them in mass, you know, plant three of them or five of them. So they form this, you know, nice clump and then you could do, you could do multiple clumps. So that's one way to do it. Um, they'll grow together, they'll cover the ground, there'll be less, less um, weed seeds germinating. Um, there's a comment about, uh, there's an atrium in the Neurology Sanford building. That's taken care of by the NPBGF, that Northern Plains Botanical, Botanical Garden. Garden Society. Yes. So they take care of that atrium. Well, it's actually one of our master gardeners there that's a go. member of both. So Emily, okay. I'll give her a shout out. She takes care of that wonderful garden. Yes. So all you have to do is sign up for Esther's master gardener mm -hmm. class, <clears throat> and you can serve your community and learn about horticulture and do a great service others uh, that person or that society also take care of the plants at the West Acres Mall yes How about that mm -hmm. they okay. do a very nice job you mean there's no uh, slugs in the hospitals <laughs> 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 well there aren't necessarily <laughs> slugs indoors in the mall <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, how about uh, you know straw bale gardening should be enabling it's off the ground, right? Yes, yes. But uh, this gardener hasn't heard much about them, straw bale gardens. Do you have any pros or cons about them? Yes, yes, I do. Um, I think that they're nice for getting, you know, getting the plants off the ground. So you definitely could, you know, you could even stack bales and, and get them higher up. Now, there, there are some cons to it. 
in that um, I think the seed started plants don't do as well as the, the transplants. I would also say that the bales dry out very quickly. So in that situation, you might want to run some drip tape across the bales. The other con with that would be rodents because you're dealing with straw, so they may make that their home. Uh, but it still can be done, but you want to know your, your source for the straw. You want to make sure that they're not contaminated with herbicides. And you want to make sure you don't have a lot of weed seeds. So it's, it's really being smart about, you know, where you get your bales and doing some planning. Okay, that's good. Any other questions out there, people? Okay, no other questions, Esther. Well, thank you very much. That was a fascinating talk about sport therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay, everybody, we're going to take a five-minute break again, and then we'll get to our last presentation.